welcome to Death Row. Like we always do about this time. Ha ha ha! I'm gonna fight your fucking ass! You don't got your plan touch butt with that dork in the park. Ah, uh, there's a little snake in the grass. Hey, I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. No fucking Jesus, people! I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody! Hey, pussy, are you still there? I back. Who the fuck is that guy? Break out the red panties. We're rich, baby. I would like to introduce... Welcome to the MMA for Money Show, episode 21. It is time. John Bones Jones, the greatest light heavyweight to ever do it, is fighting this weekend. And honestly, I can't wait to see it. Um, he is probably the most phenomenal fighter I've ever seen live. And can't wait to talk about him in a little bit before we even get to that point. Uh, I am MMA State of Mind. Uh, Bob Voss. And Mason and Mines was on Twitter. I'm your favorite garbage man. All that little tidbits and extra names. Uh, I'm here with Mike Copenhaver at Don't Cope Just Win. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing fabulous, my man. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Got some sick kids on the men. I know you've dealt with a little bit of that, including with yourself. But you know what? We're going through the rest of this week, into this weekend, healthy. That's that's, that's the goal, okay? Um, you're going to hear a few things, a bunch going through this fight card, one of which is uh, FOTUS MMA, the gym on the rise, because not only are a few of the main names uh, fighting on this card in it, but a lot of the prelim guys, apparently they want to fill as many people from that fight gym in as possible because they're somewhat local. But this is we're going to do a little bit different for this. I think we've only done this for, I want to say it was the Masvidal... Diaz card was the last time we went through absolutely everybody on the fight card, but we're going to do that this time since we have no card review. We did that uh, last time for Blades versus uh, JDS. We're going to go all the way to the bottom. The early ones are just going to be quick picks. I'll give you a little bit of info on them. Me and Michael make a quick pick on them uh, where we're leaning, if we're confident, if not. And then we'll go to the bulk of the prelims and then the main card. That will be even more information, more of breakdowns. We do have a unanimous bet on this fight card. And you know how those typically go for us. So, yes, it will only be one bet on this fight card. Official one. Obviously, we give out more via Twitter and other places, including on the website at ma 4 Money. Dot com. You will probably have some prop or full fight breakdowns from some of the great guys over there that we will do our best to share with you on Twitter so you can have as much action on this fight card as you could possibly want. But going to the very, very start of the card, we have Austin Lingo, who is 7-0. He is fighting Yusef Zalal, who is 7-2. This is a featherweight fight. Uh, both are LFA vets, although Lingo did much better in LFA and uh, also is a Fortis product. He is minus 210 versus Zalal's plus 175. My initial pick is not probably going to be much of a surprise. I'm going to go with Austin Lingo, the hometown boy, who I just see as all around has the better skill. Mike, where are you at on the first fight of UFC 247? I'm going to follow you right along, and I think that Austin Lingo, the Fortis MMA vet, will have a little bit too much for uh, little Yusuf. Now, we'll probably go just a little bit more into this one, because at least I know, pretty sure me and Mike at least have a little more info on both of these guys, but uh, Andre Uwell, I probably pronounced that wrong, I apologize, he is 15 and 6, he is currently the favorite at minus 120. He is fighting Jonathan Martinez, who is 11 and 2. This is a bantamweight fight. It's going to be a little odd looking, at least in my opinion. You got Ul, who is 5'11 with a 75 inch reach, and Jonathan Martinez, who's 5'7 with a 69 and a half inch reach. So there you got a 4 inch height differential and nearly a 6 inch reach differential. Now, Andre Ewell, although his record doesn't look phenomenal, especially in the UFC, he's only really lost to legit guys. Uh, Marlon Vera, who we've been very high on and has shown quite improvement over the last couple years, uh, finished him in the third round 
only this past October. Uh, he has went in between that and his last loss before that against Nathaniel Wood, who is a little bit of a dark horse in the division, who I believe is fighting on the next fight card. We'll be breaking him down. He also has a win over Henan Barrow, which, I mean, I guess isn't saying that much who, who Henan Barrow is now. But then his last loss before that against Patchy Mix. If that sounds familiar, that is the guy that is lighting up Bellator currently and will find himself to a title soon. So and in general, I like uh, Andre uh, Uhl as a fighter. Um, as far as Jonathan Martinez, he only has one loss in the UFC. He's currently plus 100, but his loss against uh, Andre Sukumta. And if memory serves, a fairly close fight as it went. Obviously, he ended up dropping it. Has two wins since then. Uh, not even going to try to pronounce those names. I know Penguin uh, Lu, I watched that one. Uh, he won that with a third round knee. I'm going to go with a pick, just a quick pick. I have no bet on this fight. I'm just going to go with Andre Uhl just because I think the, the reach advantage might get to Martinez as it goes down. Uh, Mike, do you have a little bit more in-depth on this one and a pick? Yeah, I actually uh, really like uh, Andre Yule. He's a southpaw, and he has a really good straight left hand, and I'm really fond of uh, fighters that have a straight left hand, especially a crisp one. And so I feel like it's going to be a little bit too much for Jonathan Martinez, um, especially after the victory versus uh, an Asian fighter. Uh, Jonathan might be a little bit too cocky. I think he's going to strike, try to strike in there, and he's going to end up getting caught on his chin by Andre's uh, famous left hand. And that's one of those fights that we do not currently have a bet on, but Andre being minus 120, if you will have a link, inkling that way, it's actually gone down to minus 120. He was a little bit higher before that, so you may eventually get plus money on this one. Now, the next fight um, will for sure just be a pick for me. I actually do not know either, either of these fighters very well. I do remember uh, Journey Newsom's last fight. He's fighting in this upcoming fight. At Bantamweight, he is 9-2. His last fight was a loss, but relatively close to Ricardo Lamas. R- Ricardo Ramos, sorry. Ricardo Lamas is going to come up later on this fight card given a uh, different opponent, but uh, Ricardo Lama just about did it again. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to throw this to Mike before I butcher the names anymore. Anymore, Mike, how do you feel about this fight between Jer- Journey Newsom and Domingo Payarte? I couldn't find too much on Domingo Payarte and uh, Journey Newsom. He seems to be super athletic and have some decent boxing, and he's young. So I, I feel like he's got the edge on that. So I would go with Journey Newsom with his athleticism. I'll tail that pick because... Clearly, I don't know enough about the opponent, so I'll just go with the guy that I know of. So, obviously, don't take that as a, hey, bet this guy. Um, finally, before we uh, jump into like, a little more in-depth on some of these prelims, you have Miles Johns, another Fortis MMA guy. He is my, oh, I'm sorry, before I do that, I didn't say the odds for the last fight. Journey Newsom is plus 110 versus uh, Domingo minus 130. Now, Miles Johns is minus 140. Uh, he's also training at Fortis MMA. He's coming off a split decision win over Cole Smith. He's fighting Mario Batista, who is plus 120. This is an MMA, MMA Lab product. Uh, this is the guy that, if you remember, that uh, Corey Sanhagen completely destroyed with, uh, I believe it was an arm bar in the first round. He has bounced back since with a win over uh, Jisoo Son. So he got the win on there. Um, I'm going to probably just go with Miles Johns on this one. Um, from what I remember of his fight and just, in my opinion, being in the superior uh, camp. I've never been too high on the MMA lab, and I actually think recently with the split at the MMA lab, it's not the best gym for most upcoming fighters. Mike, where are you at for this final of the prelims before we go a little bit further on? I agree with you on this one. I think that Miles Johns uh, is the more experienced fighter. I think that he will have the edge in this one. And the Mario Batista just doesn't have enough experience around him in his camp to get him through the final rounds. Now we are just going to slow it down slightly. You could all take a deep, deep breath with me. Breathe in, breathe out. Those were some rapid fire picks for you guys, just because we might as well go through the whole fight card. Now we're going to slow it down a little bit more with some fighters that we have a little bit more info on and bigger leans on. 
Alex Morano, who moonlights at Fortis MMA. It's not his main gym, but he has done a significant amount of training there. He is more of a local guy. He is a minus 270 favorite versus Kalin Williams, who is plus 230. Uh, Morano is on a three-fight win streak against Keenan Song, Zach Otto, and Max Griffin, a.k.a. the last fighter that shall not be named, and has been doing part of his training at the Surging Fortis, as I previously stated. Now, Williams is making his UFC debut after going 9-1. It's a good record, but that's on the Midwest regional circuit. And although I'm a Midwesterner, that is just the worst circuit ever. And he's been exclusively confined to Michigan, which is probably even worse um, <laughs> in terms of a fight. And the only thing that would be worse than that is actually really isn't worse than that. So, I mean, I, I guess uh, I'll, I'll throw the entire fight to you first, Mike, before I give even a further break on that. So where are you on Alex Morano versus Kalen Williams? I, I don't know what the hell they're doing besides setting Alex Marano up for just the easiest victory that he's had in the last 10 years. I think that Alex Marano is far, by far has way better jiu-jitsu, and I also think that he's got more experience striking, especially inside the UFC octagon. So I, I just think that Alex Marano has every way to win this fight. I don't see him losing this fight. I, I, I'd like to give him out as a pick, but his, his number is a little too steep. I just think that he rolls really easily over this kid no i completely agree um early on i was not very high on alex moreno but you know what he has made a believer out of me uh, i believe he has gotten better and better and i've just been shocked at his progression honestly like i thought his ceiling was much lower than he's ever been able to get to but i like how his striking has come together um and i'll tell you what man he just he's the type of fighter that judges love to score for so you know what that's who you want to have money on but again minus 270 can't really give that out if you were able to get it at open which i believe uh, me and mike were talking earlier that's closer to the minus 185 190 range that is where you want to get it now it's getting a little bit crazy now in the next fight it's andrea lee kgb lee is minus 340 versus lauren murphy plus 280 kgb is 30 that's this will come into play later. She's 30. She's coming off her first UFC loss, which was a split decision to Joanne Calderwood, um, who uh, Prime and a few other people on the site are, are big fans of, just in general. Lauren Murphy, 36. That's where that came into. She's a longtime WMA veteran. Uh, she's looking to keep her, win her winning UFC record going, and she's fighting out of the MMA lab. Uh, one thing I let Mike know uh, before this when we were talking back and forth is from what I have heard, Lauren Murphy was just retired. She was completely and utterly retired. The only reason she came back is the UFC was finally having her weight class. So she came for that tough season to get a chance to be in the UFC, get some wins. She was done, man. She was absolutely done. She's fought everyone with a name that she could have fought back in the day and has come back to do this. Now she's fighting a younger, hungrier fighter, who has better striking, is a better athlete. And you know me. I always go for, we all, me and Mike, we both go for the OGs, the vets, when they have a clear advantage, especially in WMMA, WMMA because so many of these women don't have the depth of fights and experience that a lot of times you do go with the one with more experience. But in this case, the deficits in speed strength striking there, there's just too much of it um my pick is andrea kgb lee and i'm gonna throw to mike i'm pretty sure he's gonna echo that but he probably has way more eloquent things to say about kgb's game mike where you at with andrea lee versus lauren murphy well i'm absolutely in love with kgb i mean i don't know if it's just a personal thing or the fact that i i love her as a women's mixed martial artist i think she's far superior in her striking game so far superior that she could easily throw combos and get enough volume and and possibly finish Murphy. I know girls don't do it often, so I don't want to say that completely, but I just really feel like if she put enough volume, she could possibly uh, cause enough damage and cuts to Lauren Murphy to to get her to, uh, to stop her. She's also a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and Lauren Murphy is just a purple belt. So she has the edge there too, and she's super aggressive on the ground when she gets there and transitioning and being dominant. So I really, really like KGB. I would, I, I would bet almost anything on everything on her that she would win this fight. Probably the best bet would be for her to win by decision, 
But I, if if I had everything in my mother to throw on a fight, I, I just truly believe that KGB is the far superior fighter. She should teach Lauren Murphy a lesson, and that's with ex, extra volume, um, outside with distance, and then being able to even possibly get her on the ground submit her. She, I feel like she can do anything she wants with Lauren Murphy. It's it's Does KGB want to go in there and be a killer? Because she can do it. So I'm going to go with KGB by devastation and anything she wants to do. The next fight has Antonio Arroyo. He is plus 110 versus Trevin Giles, who is currently minus 130. Uh, After two wins on the Contender Series, Arroyo dropped his UFC debut to Andre Munez by unanimous decision this past November. Trevin Giles is 2-2 in the UFC, coming off back-to-back losses, but not just back-to-back losses. Back-to-back losses in the third round. Not just back-to-back losses in the third round. Back-to-back losses in the third round by guillotine choke. It is hard to get that specific of a loss going. Uh, Giles is a Houston native, but he... In my opinion, he's the better fighter here. He is, and I thought he was very competitive in his last two fights where he ultimately did get subbed. Um, I do like Arroyo's ground game, and I would just stay away from this fight because I think Trevin Giles should win, but I think there's an obvious opening for him to get his third third-round guillotine choke loss in this fight. So I'm, I'm going to step up back, step back from it, but Mike, obviously you know the ground game a little bit better than me. How do you see this fight going? I'm having a tough time with this one because I can I never really can tell which fighter we're gonna get in there in the cage, and that's what I'm talking about Trevin Giles. I I just he's, he's to me he's got really really good talent, and I just can't understand why he doesn't turn it on at times. I I feel like he could do tremendous damage and could be a, a really popular fighter, but he just it just doesn't happen. So I would like to say that he would go in there and win this pretty easily. But like you said, he shows up good and then he ends up cheese balling and gets submitted by, you know, GM three is all right, but Zach Cummings is just garbage. And I don't really like the fact that he lost to him, both of them in the third rounds. So I wouldn't put my money on either of these kids, but if I had to pick one, it would be for uh, Trevin Giles to finally get a victory. Now, it is with a heavy, heavy heart that I talk about the next fight because the UFC made this fight because they hate me and they want me to cry. Uh, Derek Lewis, the Black Beast, social media sensation, elevated temperature, testicular area man, is a currently a minus 245 favorite over my longtime favorite fighter, at least within the, that division, the Horse Lord, the Sledgehammer, the Bricklayer, the fire hydrant, Alir Latifi, who is plus 205. And honestly, this is a heavyweight fight. And now at heavyweight, he's going to look even more like a fire hydrant. Um, Lewis recently fought Vigoy Ivanov and won a incredibly close split decision uh, after back-to-back finish losses, uh, one of which being the TKO to uh, JDS and the submission to Daniel Cormier. Uh, he is the ultimate Houston native. Uh, owns local businesses, trains there, probably the biggest fighter that they have there. He's welcoming Latifi to heavyweight, which again, I'm, I'm saying this with much trepidation. Um, after a two-fight skid, Alir Latifi has moved up uh, to heavyweight, which is a tall order for the 5'8 Latifi, facing off against the 6'3 and likely 40 pounds heavier Black Beast. Now, while I retain try to maintain my composure and actually give a fight breakdown. Mike, how do you feel about this? I I mean, I could really only just call it a freak show. How do you feel about this freak show? I'm not, I'm not liking it for Alir Latifi. I just don't quite get why he would sign the dotted line for this one. I mean, I'm looking at pictures of him when his fight camp and he's, he's looking smaller than Alexia Olenek and Olenek ain't nothing special. So I'm really just don't know what he's doing besides going there and getting a paycheck. I think that if Derek Lewis go, comes in there and he's mean and wants to fight, and when I say wants to fight as in like he doesn't have bubble guts and isn't thinking about fried chicken in the back, but he comes in there and wants to kill someone for a paycheck, I think Derek Lewis could easily win this fight. He has plenty of power to knock out Latifi, and I believe he's got enough takedown defense to get his paws on Latifi's head. So at some point, Derek Lewis is making contact with Ilya Latifi's head, his mighty large head, I might add you. And so I think that he's going to knock out Ilya Latifi, and that just don't see any other way. 
Mike pretty much said it all there. It, it's difficult because like I, li- I like Derek Lewis. I like Derek Lewis the gimmick. I like Derek Lewis the fighter. He gets frustrating when he doesn't fight. Um, when he just kind of lingers. When he doesn't throw nearly any volume. No power shots. Does his like take a shot, take a step back, tilt his head to the side. Does a slight grimace and a wink but still doesn't throw back for long stretches of the fight and getting out volumed, losing a fight, but he can do that because he has, he can finish fights. How many times has he been down on the scorecards and got the finish that he needed? This could be one of those fights where he just decides he doesn't want to fight. Uh, Latifi will be the faster fighter. Um, won't have enough power, has the superior wrestling, but the sheer size differential probably nixes most of that. I mean, unless he can get, Black Beast down in the first or second round, ideally both, and tire him out. But even then, he carries his power late. I mean, I don't see much of a way that it doesn't end with like Latifi looking up at the lights, which is very disappointing for me. But I will be rooting for him. I mean, the pick is Lewis, but I will be tickled pink, say very inappropriate things, and probably dance if Latifi wins. So who knows? Maybe I'll record that for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to a a lot of people are saying a much more competitive fight. I mean, me, me and Mike don't necessarily see it that way, but uh, Dan Ige is plus 115 versus one time future star Mirsad Bektik at minus 135. Um, Ige is seemingly the popular underdog play. I've seen quite a few play on him. He is 4 and 1 in the UFC, um, but he's facing off against the one time big prospect, the future GSP, Mirsad Bektik. I remember people saying so much of that when he first burst onto the scene. Um, Mirsad famously beat up Darren Elkins from pillar to post, pretty much to within an inch of his life, tiring himself out and getting ultimately finished in the latter half of the third and final round. One of the biggest upsets at the time. I want to say going into the fight, Elkins was a plus 700, but that's just where my memory is at. I can't remember if that was live or what he came in at. After a bounce back fight post ACL injury, uh, he got back on the winning side against Godfredo Pepe with a body shot in the first. Um, next would be a split decision win over featherweight mainstay Ricardo Lamas and a devastating first round TKO loss to heavy hitter Josh Emmett, which, I mean, I can't take too much from him. Emmett is one of the hardest hitters of the division. And yes, that was in the first round, but I don't know. I've, I think he's bounced back to a degree. Uh, Bektik is the superior wrestler, in my opinion, um, and at absolute worst, if he wants to, he can hold Ige down for three rounds. He absolutely can. Mirsad has fought and beat a higher level of competition. He has lost to a higher level of competition, too, but he's beat a higher level of competition than Dan Ige has. Uh, I have not been as impressed with Ige as so many others have, and I am siding with Bektik on this fight. Mike, where are you on Dan Ige versus Mirsad Bektik? This is going to be a great fight, in my opinion. Mirsad Bektik, I, I believe he's just he's super undervalued and underrated right now because of that last loss versus Josh Emmett. I think that people are just forgetting how heavily handed Josh Emmett is and how what a freaking nature uh, he is when it comes to that power. So I don't want to put too much credit into that because other than that Marshad Bektik is a, the more experienced well-rounded fighter he's training at TriStar with GSP who GSP has been super active lately so I expect his wrestling to be super sharp and well-versed Dan Eag is he he is a threat he's a threat in the sense of the fact that he's a black belt and I'm at the that's the only thing that I really do worry about but Mursad Bektik has never been submitted and that has never tapped and has never given me anything to worry about. I believe that Mursad Bektik striking on his best day is better than Dan Eag and he should easily be able to outpoint us a victory on the feet and then on the ground get us the takedowns that we need secured to win this fight. So yes, well, this is going to be our unanimous pick for the show and we're going to be back in Mursad Bektik. And that bet is uh, to win one unit at uh, Bektik's current price of minus 135. That is our bet for the show. And uh, before we move on, we are currently as a show for the year, obviously very early in the year, but we are plus 1.45 for the year. And if we win this one, we'll be at plus 2.45. But moving on, Juan Adams. 
Sorry, I tried to be more excited about that, but this fight is. Wait, who? I don't understand. I don't understand the placement on the card. I don't understand so many things about this fight, other than the fact that apparently the UFC loves Juan Adams. Um, Juan Adams is minus two forty five. Go ahead. Not as much. Not as much as he loves little Debbie. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that is true. If you, if you guys don't know that, he has gone uh, over and above explaining his love, his undying love for little, little Debbie snack cakes. But um, Juan Adams, he is minus two forty five versus Justin Taffa was plus 205. Juan Adams made a name for himself in the lead up to the fight with the controversial Greg Hardy. Um, after a whole lot of bluster and personality on full display, Hardy finished him with hammer fist in the very first round. On the other side of the cage, Justin Taffa, who found himself on the last Australia card where he was quickly dispatched by Jorgen De Castro. Um, and little minor note, Justin Taffa got into the UFC when they were uh, um, coming to Australia at 3-0. Obviously, he lost, so he is 3-1. and one. So, in the fight just before the co-main event on a UFC pay-per-view, there's a guy who's 3-1. and one. I can't not believe I'm saying that. I mean, even Juan Adams, uh, I believe he's 6-2, and two, um, but even that, it's just, or 5-2. and two. I, I don't get the placement on the card. I can see this fight being further down uh, on the prelims. I don't understand how this is above... He gave respect. I cannot understand how this is above Lewis versus Latifi. I mean, I some of the other ones, I guess I could see it above, but like over half these fights, I, I don't understand how this is above. But whatever. Before I go too far with it, um, I'll go with Little Debbie. I just think he's a better fighter. Uh, he has better upside. Uh, he's finally training at a place that has heavyweights to train with rather than him having to try to go on Facebook and find guys in the local area that'll come train with him. So here's hoping that bodes well for Juan Adams because, I mean, dude is entertaining. So, Mike, how do you feel about this heavyweight quote-unquote fight? I'm actually, I like Justin Taffa. He trains at City Kickboxing with um, Israel Adesanya and a bunch of the other guys. So I, I understand that possibly they're setting him I think they're setting him up for a fight that he could win versus little Debbie Snack Cake Boy. I don't think that Juan Adams deserves to be in the UFC and I I never say that against or, or about a D1 a collegiate wrestler. I have a ton of respect for them, but I just at this this point in time the Snack Cake Boy has just not proven it to me enough to he wants to be here. I really believe that if if this Islander, I believe he was, uh, he's a New Zealander, sorry, uh, but still, an, usually, I think they're connected to the Polynesian Islands some in some way. Either way, big boy, two big boys are in the street. I'd have to go with the Polynesian, New Zealander, Islander all day long. So I, I really, I'm going to have to go with Tafa to make an upset here because I don't know what they're doing with Juan Adams and he's not a fighter like that we like. In the co-main event... Caitlin Chukagian is a plus 700 underdog versus Valentina Shevchenko, the reigning defending all that jazz, who's minus 1,100. Caitlin Chukagian passed up her first option to fight Valentina Shevchenko because, well, she was getting married. Well, so now she gets her chance. Um, I honestly see her as the poor man's Holly Holm, Um, as hard as that is to say. I think she fights in a very similar way. But, I mean, maybe at this point better, because I do think uh, Holm has slowed down a little bit. She's still probably the best in her division. I would probably say Chikagian maybe a little bit faster. Uh, Valentina Shevchenko will be going against the tennis grunt champion of a women's 125. If you don't know what that is, go back and look at any Chikagian fight, and you will experience its wonder. Um, Personally, I love Valentina Shevchenko. She's one of my favorite female fighters to watch. I love her striking style. Uh, she is a counter striker, which sadly can lead to very boring fights. Uh, don't let it, let it get twisted or let you get fooled because she's had some finishes. In general, she's a counter striker, and she even gets those finishes that way too. I, not I, me, I just got I barreled towards her and got countered tremendously, especially with that head kick that took her out. Um, I don't think Chikagian's going to be that. 
Sorry for the pause. I'm trying to think of a nicer way to say dumb, but Chicagian's not going to be as dumb just because I was. And she is going to play it smarter. Uh, it's going to be a closer fight than that for sure. And I actually do think Chicagian can win at least a round or two, but I do think it's going to be a clear decision win for Shevchenko. So if you are in line with me, I haven't decided and maybe won't even bet this, but the entire fight going to decision is minus 160, which is better than you'll get for Shevchenko. And Shevchenko by decision is, I just had that number listed for you guys, and now it is eluding me. This is not cool. There we go. Uh, minus 125. And I honestly think that's her, the, her most likely way to win. So the fact that it's minus 125, I find quite shocking. I don't know why there would be such a thought that she's going to win inside the distance, but or lean that way. So minus 125 for Shevchenko to win the decision. I, even though it being five rounds, I lean much heavier that way than really any other way she wins. Um, Mike, I know you are a little bit higher on Chikigian than me. So by all means, how do you think she's going to win or how do you think the fight's going to end? Oh, don't get me too high on Chikigian. I just thought that she had decent enough ground game and length in jiu-jitsu that caused maybe a problem if she gets a top position or a, the back of Valentina. I, I still believe Valentina is one of the best mixed martial arts ever made and ever created. I, I love her as a as a woman and as a person. I love that she loves shooting firearms and she takes her ninja skills seriously in every way. Shevchenko should win this fight in any way she wants. I think going to a decision is the best bet. I, why wouldn't you want to bet this fight to go to a decision and get both fighters at negative 160? It's just There's a ton of value on that when most women's fights go to a decision. So if you have the money to slam and you want to slam that, I, I don't see why you wouldn't because it, you're getting basically Valentina and Shevchenko at a very, very discounted price. But I really believe that Valentina Shevchenko will go in there, outstrike this uh, ten, this tennis match chick, uh, and make her scream a little bit more than she wanted. Possibly cut her up and do whatever she wants to do. But I, I most likely a uh, decision victory, and she'll retain and still. So now the real reason that this fight card even really exists as a pay per view. Uh, this will be the second time in as many pay per views that largely it's a one fight card. I don't mean to diminish so many of the fighters that are earlier on this fight card, but really every other fighter on this fight card would look just as good on a Fight Night card, uh, ESPN Plus card, any of those. I mean, I guess Shevchenko over Shikagian is a solid co-main event for a pay-per-view, but really all the others, they're just stereotypical Fight Night cards, which I'm, I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from getting this, because I mean, I, I do truly think that regardless any john jones fight card is worth getting just for the history factor and the possibility of a wow moment i know the wow moments are a little bit fewer and farther between but if you have been in attendance or even seen one of these wow moments in person they leave an impression. Trust me, I've been I've been there for one or two. They they've changed the way you see the sport. It's it's beyond impressive when you see him really go out and do a finish if that's what he's going to do. So, John Jones is fighting Dominic Reyes. Okay, Dominic Reyes is plus three thirty five. John Jones minus four twenty. He's actually going down. He was minus four fifty even just yesterday. Uh, the Devastator, which is Reyes' nickname, uh, is looking to shock the world against the light heavyweight champ. Reyes is undefeated at 12-0 after his last KO win over formal middleweight champion Chris Weidman. Uh, he's definitely starting to get some uh, name power on his resume and a lot of finishes within there. And even there's that, I think it was the OSP one where it should have been a finish, but it went technically past the time even though OSP was unconscious. John Jones recently had a split decision win over Anilis Tiago Santos that some gave the fight to based off his wildly throwing power shots and missing. Sorry to be that blunt about it, but that's honestly how I saw that fight. So many people gave it to Santos because John didn't look absolutely untouchable and it's getting to a point now that he is so dominant that whenever a fight is close, people start to give rounds to his opponent. 
which is ridiculous to me. And that, that that's going as far back as when he fought Lyoto Machida. So many people gave him the first round because Lyoto Machida landed one really good left hand on the chin that seemed to make John pause for a second. Like, that's how far back that goes of people giving away rounds from someone that make look John less than a mortal. Um, John has definitely become much more defensively minded uh, in his last few fights. I would say going back even further, probably to the OSP fight. I know that was after he came back from... Uh, the suspension and whatnot, and he does have the. I'm not counting to finish. I'm not counting to no contest over Daniel Cormier and the ground and pound over Gustafson. But it seems that John may have one stellar moment that could lead to a finish, and if it doesn't quite get there, then he dials it back and plays it safe, uh, like with the Anthony Smith fight, how he got close to a finish, never quite got, it, and then just kind of backpedaled and fought smart for the remainder of the fight. If this is a longevity thing, I think, trying to take less damage and so he could keep going longer, although the more rounds you're in, the less rounds you'll ultimately be able to fight at 100%, so I guess we'll see how that goes. Um, I don't necessarily think John is going to get the finish. I think he could. One thing going for Reyes that I do like is he's a southpaw. John has had some difficulty with southpaws in the past and go with Yoda Machida and, and and so forth. Reyes does have power and he's fast. The three of those, those things put together could surprise John somewhat, especially because John does get hit a little bit more. Um, I do think he needs to chop Reyes legs down early to let him know those leg kicks are there to at least freeze up um, Reyes offense, which I think will be a major key to what he needs to do. Uh, I do think John is better just about everywhere. I really do, other than just raw power. And we've seen with that dozen past fights, John finds a way to win, and he will. And I know that both me and Mike are huge John fans. And I mean, how could you not be if you've been in the sport for a good amount of time, and especially if you were around for his rise? Like, it's utterly amazing, and I don't think he'll start having trouble till he goes up to heavyweight, and even then, only a couple guys. So I think this is going to be a clear win for John Jones. Um, obviously, the minus 420 is not like a, hey, guys, this is our premium bet. Pet, pay us however much and bet John Jones. That's not really what we're going to do. I mean, I would think he is a good parlay piece if you have another one that you want to get a little bit juiced and get a little bit better odds, or if you really have a major inkling for John Jones. But I stopped doing John Jones props, I think with the OSP fight, because I just saw no way he wasn't going to get the finish, and it went to decision. And, and every other time after that, he's just, whenever you think he should get an easy finish, like in his last two fights, he doesn't get it. And then when it was going to be the rematch with Gustafson, you're like, oh, this might be the first time in a while it's going to go to decision, and he gets the finish. So I ultimately don't play props for John Jones. I don't play props for a lot of people, but especially John Jones. But the pick is John Jones by just about any way he wants to or put the effort in doing. Mike, where are you in regards to John Dwight Jones? Well, Jones is the greatest of all time, and there's nobody younger, faster, stronger than he's portrayed to be in his whole career. He's always shown up in every single fight that he's shown up to. Even the people hated on him, and he went to a decision and said it was boring. I feel like he did those things on purpose, and he he's just toying with people. So I think that he could finish Reyes. He could do anything he wants to do with this kid. I, I really believe that there's... There are way different levels of this game, and I, I don't understand how Dominic Reyes thinks that he has that John Jones has never experienced the athlete that Dominic Reyes is when John Jones' two brothers play in the NFL and are two of the greatest freaking defensive football players and football players there are. So John's been rolling around with them since he was since ever since. Just like I've been rolling around my big bro who's four years older, and it it caused me to be meaner than I should at the size that I am. So I, I don't know what Dominic is thinking, trying to provoke John Jones to become angrier, but the lion's coming, and he's going to come, and he's going to whoop this kid's ass. I, I really feel like he's going to get us the finish that we've been looking for, but I, I think possibly a submission because he's been sh trying to show off his grappling, and he's been working really, really hard on it. I believe he's a purple belt now in jiu-jitsu, and that's really far advanced for John Jones, who didn't even take it serious for a long time while he was sniffing lines off girls' butts cracks. So I think John Jones is going to come in there and just dominate and do what John Jones does. 
Well, and that's a very good point about the submission game because as much as everybody's going for Reyes, and I've heard plenty of people say that he has a chance, and like he has a better chance than other guys John has fought. He absolutely does. I'm not going to say he has no chance. In MMA, everybody has a chance. As cliche as that is, everybody's got some chance in MMA. Um, he probably has better chance than most at light heavyweight, like than the majority of the division. But even though he does have a wrestling background, and not a lot of people have been commenting on that. Reyes actually does have a wrestling background. Um, nothing crazy, but he does have one. John Jones is the superior wrestler in that regard. And if he can get him down, the two things John Jones doesn't do enough, in my opinion, I don't know why he doesn't, is ground and pound and work his submission game. Because even early in his career, he was just so natural at both of them. And he's got even better at both of them. The Gustavus fight proves the ground and pound. And he has submitted black belts in UFC competition. He had like he's just such a phenom at those things. I don't know why he doesn't just go to it, because he would have a lot more finishes on his resume than he currently does. Now with that being said, that is the UFC fight card. Obviously, if you could, if you would, if you even like us a little bit, can you please rate and review and subscribe for this podcast on iTunes, on everything you could possibly listen to it on. Also, please check out our YouTube channel. It is amazing. Uh, It has this full podcast on there. It has a breakdown of this podcast into per fight segments. If there's one fight that you really have an inkling that you want to listen to, it's there. We also do have the reviews up there, and we're trying to get more content up there for you guys, especially a little shorter content, little snacks, if you will. And spread of the word and again me and mike's dms are always open for anyone who wants to talk about mma or whatever um i su- the only reason i suggest dms is because i tend to see those first and that's what i check first when i sign on uh with the amount of times i do sign on so i'm always up for talking mma i know mike is too especially with fans of mma in general and fans of ours so mike what do you have to say to the people before we sign off going into this john jones ufc fight weekend I just hope all you guys have a great time, enjoy these fights, and watch the greatest of all time, John Jones, do his thing. And if you get a chance, uh, and this comes out, this will come out before uh, our Fox show called Outmatched. The third episode will be on Thursday at 8.30 after Last Man Standing, which is a Tim Allen special. Ours will be with Jason Biggs. It's super hilarious, so make sure you tune in because it's family fun and, and more. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, that is a show currently on Fox that Mike works on the set of. Uh, can say for personal experience, uh, me and my wife have watched the first two episodes and find it hilarious. We are actually have been actively looking for good 30-minute sitcoms to be able to watch just because sometimes with the amount of time you have at the end of the night, especially with the job that I do, how early I go to bed, how early I get up, sometimes we only have time for a half-hour show, and it's been... Real nice. (laughs) Brought uh, some good laughs for us. So uh, with all that being said, check out Mike's show. Uh, Outmatch is really funny. It's also available on Hulu within about a day of it. It's usually how we watch it because we are unplugged. I mean, we got Hulu Live, but most things we watch after the fact. So with that said, and UFC 247 on the horizon, let's roll. (laughs) 